This program started with a very simple question, and I think sometimes the greatest things start with the simple questions. It was from Melinda Gates, and she said, if I can find a Coke anywhere in the world, even in some of the most rural locations, how come we can't find vaccines? That's a very powerful question, and one that we had to step back and reflect on. And when we reflected on that, we started Project Last Mile, and it started in Tanzania and Ghana, and it was about reaching the people who had not been reached before. And what we learned very quickly, and that's what Mark described very well up here, is that it wasn't just about writing a check, it was truly about building the capability there in the local systems. And so think about Tanzania, it used to have about 150 warehouses. They would store the vaccines, and I think as everyone in here knows, they're very temperature precious. And so a lot of times the spoilage rates would be very high. And so if you look at Coca-Cola's distribution system, we're very well known for refrigeration, for logistics. We worked with the ministers of health there and through Project Last Mile and the Global Fund to talk about how do you build capability and get the vaccines closer to where the people are. Well, today they have over 5,000 health facilities now that distribute those vaccines across Tanzania, much closer to where the individuals who need them are living. And so that decreases the amount of travel time for those individuals, the spoilage, and the list goes on. But it started with that very basic question, which is how can we think about getting these types of you know, life-saving devices to individuals who need them most through your system and capability, not just through the money that a company can provide? Thank you. And I'll come back to you later with, with another question. Um, but turning to Carl. Um, his eye is also present in so many countries around the world, but also particularly in Africa, and, and we've been working you know, in many programs together. Um, PSI is well known for its innovative approaches, also in terms of social marketing. Can you tell us a little bit you know, how your approach works, and can you give some examples, maybe? Sure. I'm, uh, listening to Bea, I think that you know, the anecdote about Melinda Gates and Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola more appropriately, yeah is one that has inspired so many reflections in so many different fields of activity. I, I think many people within my own company, PSI, and we've been around for 45 years, uh, would tell that story similarly. You know, if a Coca-Cola can be found in the most remote rural village, why can't a mosquito net be found there? Why can't a condom be found there? Why can't there be family planning products and so forth? So uh, Coca-Cola has inspired not just the Gates Foundation and governments, but also nonprofits like mine. Social marketing, really was born from the, the conception that uh, the private sector has much to teach us about how to reach consumers, that there is much value in treating uh, the people you're trying to help or serve as consumers, people with choice, people who have the dignity of choice. Uh, they're not simply beneficiaries, they're not recipients. In, they are consumers, and we know in the context of Africa in particular, they're healthcare consumers. Um, disproportionately getting their health care, such as it is, from the private sector. Uh, because public sector institutions may be weak or underfunded, and there is no other way for people, particularly remote, rural, um, uh, stigmatized communities, to get access to products and services. So the discipline behind social marketing is to look at your target audience, understand fundamentally their barriers to uptaking the service or the product that we know is good for their health, but also good for the community's health. Uh, that's the principle behind social marketing. It's not just about the individual's well-being, but the actions that the individual takes will benefit the community. Uh, and that, uh, that idea that um, marketing is at the basis of our approach, understanding the barriers that the consumer has to taking up the behavior that we all want, and then inspiring ourselves with the discipline of the private sector, including the ability to carefully steward resources and be very cost effective at how we do our work, that is what underlies social marketing. And so you're left with organizations like mine, which sell things in some cases, give things away, but always are trying to think about our work in terms of markets, marketing, consumers, how to shape those markets so they work better for the poor. Thank you, Carl. Turn to you, David. You've been working in the banking sector for a long time, and you've also been partner to the Global Fund for a long time. Um, can you share a little bit your experience? Also, what led EcoBank as one of the leading banks in Africa, not only to work with the Global Fund, but now to renew um, you know, with the partnership? And, and how does it look like for you for the future? 
Well, I think, I think um, first of all, you know, it wasn't a difficult decision for us to sort of renew this partnership. You know, I think that actually tells a story in itself because, uh, you know, if you've run for three years and things are going well, it's great to have the chance to, to, to renew. For us, you know, there were several, several reasons why it became an easy decision, really. I mean, first of all, I mean, in terms of the, looking at the donors into Africa, you know, the Global Fund beats anybody else in terms of its investment in fighting these three diseases. So that's, a, that's a, an easy start option. But as Julie said earlier, you know, health and health for the community is such a, an underlying pillar for sort of prosperity that, you know, that's actually vital, you know, for us you know, to think about. Echo Bank's founders, you know, we're not an old bank, you know, we're 30, near just about 30 years old. When they founded the group, they, yes, they wanted to have a world-class pan-African financial institution, but they weakly, very, very wise at the beginning because they said, we have to play a role in the economic and social growth of the communities that we're serving. And we're in 33 countries, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it, has to be, it has to be a given. Um, and then it's a question of trust. We found that by working with the Global Fund, um, working in the three countries that, that we've spoken about earlier, we found that people take a long time to build a trust. People, especially these days, take a long time to build trust in banks. So for us, the work we're doing with you, what we're doing on the ground, what we've seen and really being positive, acting, that actually helps us with our broader business. And of course, our staff, you know, as, as Julie mentioned, we've got 20,000 staff across the continent. Staff love to be involved in something that helps their communities. Mm. So it was an easy decision. Great, thank you. Turning back to you, Bea. You know, we have exciting examples of what the private sector has already been doing. One question is, can it be scaled up? You know, it's wonderful to hear about, you know, pilot like in Tanzania, yeah. I'm very familiar with and so on. But sometimes there's also the skepticism, you know, is that just a pilot or can that really be scaled up on a larger scale? We're talking about the African continent here today. Can you talk a little bit about the plans of Coca-Cola, how to scale up? Some yes, of these, and uh, I agree with you. Examples. Internally, people make fun of me because actually inside my building, I don't say pilot, I say phase one. Yeah. Because I do believe that people a lot of times go into pilots with the notion of, oh, when it's done, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And really, that's not what it's about. Pilots are about learning and continuing to scale. So we set the goal to go into 10 countries by 2020. We started to reinvest another $21 million through the Global Fund in order to get to that destination. Today we're in six countries, so we might have started with Tanzania and Ghana. We're now Tanzania, Ghana, Mozambique, Swaziland, South Africa, Nigeria, and we will keep going. And so what we've learned, though, is also that one size doesn't fit all. And so where we might have to apply more logistics management and supply chain management learning in one area, in another it might be about refrigeration techniques. And so we know that our refrigeration, some of the hottest climates, it's 90% reliable. Mm. But if you look at the refrigerators that were being used for the vaccines, they were not. And so how do you actually teach and train and look at the refrigeration at that local point of distribution? And then what happens when it breaks down? Is that person who's managing that refrigerator trained to fix it? Or do they have to wait and then everything spoils? And so in another country, maybe in South Africa, it's about getting the points of distribution right. So we've looked very carefully to say that as we scale, we can't assume that what we did in one country is going to be appropriate in another. And so we've started to build a customized approach with the local partnerships as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. And Carl, we also have to talk about sustainability. You know, right. if we look into the future, it's, um, it's great what, what all the organizations here are doing, but it's also a question of how can you transfer to, to local ownership and so on. Can you talk a little bit what, what PSI's plans are in terms of the longer term perspective, you know, to, to encourage local partners and then to ensure long term sustainability? Right, I think scale and sustainability are the two overarching challenges for us, right, in this work. Um, I, w we start from the premise that what got a nonprofit like us to where we are today, thanks to long standing partnership with the Global Fund and, and many other funders is certainly not what's going to work 10 or 20 years from now. The world is fundamentally at a transition moment or pivot point, at least my world is, in terms of how our work is funded. Um, we know there will be a need for subsidy to reach many of the people that we try and reach with life-saving products and services. Much of the work of the Global Fund will need subsidy 
the, the $13 billion is certainly going to be very important and wisely used. But we also know that the subsidy will not reach all of the needs. And we also understand that markets are developing. Africa is thriving in many ways. And there is an opportunity to um, get more of the resources that are necessary for this improvement from host governments from, and eventually from consumers as well. So we look at that transition in our work as being about how we go from being, as a nonprofit, fundamentally paid by donors in the global north to increasingly being hired by our host governments to deliver part of their health outcomes as part of an integrated health system and also covering some of the costs necessary through the, the actions of the consumer. Um, uh, people's ability to pay is probably higher in most of the markets where we operate than we give it credit at being. Uh, in that sense, um, we've tried to explore the bound, well, we've been forced to actually explore the boundaries of, um, the outer boundaries of social enterprise. Uh, I'll give you an example. In, in Southern Africa, we have long been um, distributing condoms, funded by, largely by USAID. Um, uh, that subsidy has disappeared. 75% of the condom uh, volume in South Africa has, is, is associated with work that PSI has done. Should those condoms simply be stopped? Uh, should, that, should that activity end? No, the recognition is that we have to turn that into a social enterprise that is self-sustaining. And in fact, we're doing that. And that will happen more and more in our work. The subsidy that has underpinned a lot of the work that nonprofits do in global health is shifting declining, and we have to be creative about how we create um, a more sustainable outlook to continue that very important work. And I think there are a lot of ways to do it, and, and we're experimenting with social enterprise is one, one way to do that. Right. Thank you. And David, you talked about your workforce in Africa. I think you mentioned 20,000 employees in Africa. Um, you're working from the headquarters level when you're not traveling in the countries and so on. How, how do you get your staff, your employees in the countries engaged and, and enthusiastic about this. Uh, can you share us a little bit about that? I think, I think we all know that for any of these initiatives to be successful, you have to have the local ownership. And you know, that's the first thing we have to do, local ownership and project management. Those are the sort of key things. Let me perhaps sort of just give you an example. We, we've done some of our capacity, financial management capacity building work in South Sudan. You know, there can't be many more harder places to work than in South Sudan right now. And yet there we've got full support from our managing director and our treasurer in the country. Um, the work we've done there is with four of the national programs and it was some work over, we did two years running actually, we did it sort of over about sort of uh, three or four months. But the interesting thing was, and I was talking with Carl last night, we engaged with PSI in the country, and uh, we worked with them, and also with the UN, with UNDP. And that actually was really great for us, because it was, you know, we were all helping each other to sort of try and persuade and cajole with the government some of the things that needed to be done. So, so for us, that was important. It was, I mean, our operation in South Sudan was only started in July 2013. And yet, sort of fast forward just three years, you know, we've now got 24 NGOs with us there. We won the United Nations tender. We've got six of the UN agencies banking with us. And, and we've got a position, you know, and, and I think in a country like that, what the clients have said and what we've, what we've found is that they need a trusted partner, so a trusted international bank. And that's where working with the Global Fund and working with our project there, it was very easy to persuade our people to get, in, get involved. Yeah, we, we are talking about a thriving African continent here, and we really we, we are already seeing that, uh, and that must have you know some impact also on the thinking in, in Coca Cola. I mean, it's a, it's a very important market for you, you know, both from a business point of view, but also for your social activities. If you look into the future, how do you see the kind of relationship there, and 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 how Coca Cola can contribute both kind of as a market and you know, as a social partner for, for many of these activities. Yes, well, I do love the fact that Julie earlier talked about a thriving Africa and to hear the story here from David and, and Carl's work. What's, what's interesting for us is we set at a very high level three goals, water, women, well-being. 
And we know that if you don't have very bold and aggressive goals, and so I'll just share a quick story on two of them. We set a goal to replenish 100% of the water we use around the world. When that goal was set, most people looked at our chairman and CEO and said, has he lost his mind? There's no way you can get there, and how do you do it? And we just announced that we've made it to 115%. Now, we're not done. We still have a lot of work to do. It was highly complex, took a lot of partnerships. Is it perfect in every geography? No, that's an aggregated goal. And so we know that we can't stop. I also loved hearing the story about what EcoBank is doing on women. Financial inclusion is just as important. If you have financial health and physical health, you know that that community will thrive. It's unstoppable. And we also know that women are the core to thriving communities. All of the statistics are there. We know that when a man earns a dollar, so forgive me, you all do not give back as much. You give back about 40 to 50 percent. Sadly true. Sadly true. We won't tell people in here where you're spending it. But um, when a woman earns a dollar, she gives 90 cents back to her community to enable her community to thrive. And so by simply providing women the tools to be empowered, and so we also set a very bold, aggressive goal to empower economically 5 million women by 2020. Today we're at 1.2 million women in 60 countries. Over 60% of those women are right in Africa. We saw that in South Africa, when we did some studying, that those women were able to grow their revenues of their business by over 40% simply by learning digital bookkeeping, understanding how to drive their business, where to put their products in their stores, very simple things that maybe some of us in developed countries take for granted, but that simply by teaching those women and giving them access to capital, which by the way, they do pay back, and I'm sure you know that very well, yeah. it has been life-changing for those women in those communities. And that, for us, makes us very proud because when we see women like that, and I've met this one woman, her name is Rosemary in Africa, and she was talking to me about simply learning that enabled her to buy her own home, pay herself a salary, and put her kids into private schools. Well, she didn't stop. She started to empower other women. Well, I knew that whether or not Coke were there because those tools were already provided, she was going to continue to thrive. And now Rosemary had her own story, and Coke was just simply a small part of that. So I say keep going. We do know Africa is going to thrive if we all continue to work together. I think Julie's call to action earlier was right. We cannot say that we've done enough. None of us have done enough. Even if we're proud of the results and the progress, we all have to do more. And everyone in this room can work together to do that. Can I just comment on that? Actually, I was asking you, Carl, to kind of okay. to, to build on that question. You know, what's um, your vision? Well, the, the, the thing that strikes me about this is, you know, we often have conversations about these issues in our own silos. And, you know, I talk with other NGOs, and you may or may not talk with other banks, but, you know, we don't always have these sort of transversal conversations. And it struck me, you know, the Global Fund, we, we have a long experience with the Global Fund, and we have a lot of scar tissue to show for that because it's been a difficult and learning experience for both institutions. Because the Global Fund, of course, set out to do something that's really ambitious. It's not just to save the 20 million lives that, has been, that have been saved. It's also to build the, the capacity of civil society to be a full partner in sort of policy making at the national level. It's also to demand that governments step up to their own responsibilities. It's leveraging not just the governments that are going to contribute uh, over the next two days, but also the private sector partners and the nonprofit partners that are part of your funding landscape. You, you have created this comprehensive and complex um, ecosystem, I would say, that is drawing from NGOs and the global private sector and the African private sector, and I know you do this in other parts of the world too, and all of the transformational work that's happened within the countries that are Global Fund recipients, and Mark, I know, never fails to address the rights angle of what you do. I mean, I think it's amazing, and, and congratulations to the fund for having walked this walk and brought all of these different stakeholders together into what is a complex, ambitious, but ultimately high-performing institution, I think. So we learn from working with Coke and Echo Bank, and I think we're better for it. Um, and Happily, that's been brought about through the context of the Global Fund. Thank you, Carl. David, I'll ask you. Yeah. Um, you know, 
when we think in terms of Africa transformation, there's one thing which I want to say, which I think may come up in the next couple of days as well. When we look at sort of Africa and we think about Africa transformation, the sort of buzzword which is sort of coming around these days is digi digitalization, if I can say it, digitalization. And, you know, if you think about Africa and you think that in the middle of last year there was something like 350 million subscribers, you know, with mobile phones. And people reckon that sort of come 2018, that number's going to be up at sort of 500 million you know, sort of subscribers. You know, that's a lot of people, a lot of people in the informal sector that sort of have access to, to media and to, to whatever. We see, we're seeing, think about what does this all mean? You know, we, we're seeing drones, you know, delivering things to, to rural locations, I, I guess medical supplies and things. I don't think Coca-Cola, but I mean, yeah. too, we too heavy. <laughs> but you guys using drones, yeah, yeah. Think about, um, you know, the sort of the, the model for, for the health sector. Think about M Health and think about how people, you know, no longer need to spend hours visiting the doctor. You know, they can be on their phone and they can get prescriptions and whatever. So, you know, that's an amazing opportunity there. Think um, in the financial sector, you know, for us, um, it's very expensive and we won't continue sort of building out our branch network. I mean, we have, we have the largest branch network with 1,300 branches, but that's peanuts. That's nothing, you know, in terms of the distribution outlets and what you need to reach out into communities. So when we look at the sort of the mobile uh, opportunity, you know, it's not about building branches anymore. It's actually about partnering with the MNOs and trying to find smart solutions where they've got, you know, thousands of distribution outlets. So that's the sort of thing we're thinking about. And one of the things I was really, sometimes coincidence, you know, occurs. This week, our CEO, who will be here lunchtime today, he made an announcement uh, to all our staff that we've just launched our own Echo Bank mobile app. And that means that, yes, other people have got mobile banking and mobile money and whatever, but nobody's got an integrated solution that covers 33 countries. I mean, that's, that's amazing in terms of the opportunity. And uh, if we then talk, Julie mentioned financial inclusion, and we think about what does this mean? Well, all of a sudden, we've got a target base of 100 million clients, you know, 100 million potential clients that are doing really good work in the informal sector, but they don't have access to, to banking capability. And of course, all of this means that, you know, we, we gradually can get integrated. We need partners. We have to have those partners. But then it all leads to sort of, you know, what opportunities there are in different sectors. And we're coming back, of course, today to the health sector, and we're thinking about what does it mean for health. And we've all said that we need sort of healthy communities and in turn that leads to, pro to prosperous communities. So I think this whole digitalization and the mobile opportunity, I think the likes with us, the partners and all of you guys in the room, there's some amazing opportunities out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. There, Carl and David. I think we should give them a round of applause.